Moss Adams is pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize both how you view our presentation and how you interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. For example, you can click the file folder icon to download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by clicking Q&A in the bottom left-hand portion of the icon bar and typing in your question. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. We'll ask polling questions throughout today's presentation. Per the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy Webcast CPE Standards, CPE credit will be awarded based on your participation in these polls. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. If you're attending this webcast in a group, in order to receive CPE credit, you must complete our attendance sheet available in the file folder icon at the bottom of your screen. Please have all group members sign the sheet and please remit only one sheet per group. Also note, today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and is not available to participants who view the on-demand version. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon to open a PDF file you can save to your computer. We'll email a copy of your PDF certificate in two weeks if you can't download it today. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see is not legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. Good morning and welcome to today's webcast, Sustainable Food Business Best Practices. I'm happy to introduce today's speakers from Moss Adams, Justin Neff and Nick Frank. Justin has been in public accounting since 2005. He specializes in providing assurance and financial reporting services to middle market private companies. Justin's client base includes a wide variety of businesses with a focus on the food and beverage and manufacturing and consumer products industry groups. As a member of Moss Adams Corporate Social Responsibility Working Group, Justin also has a background in developing sustainability reports and providing assurance and attestation services over these and other corporate social responsibility reports. Nick has 14 years of public accounting experience specializing in providing tax services for entities in the manufacturing industry with an emphasis on food and beverage companies. The majority of Nick's time is spent helping companies and the owners maximize their tax situation to help achieve cash flow and business goals. Nick is also very well versed in family transition planning, mergers and acquisitions, state and international issues, defending IRS exams, and various industry-specific tax credits. Justin, I will now turn the line over to you to get us started. Thanks, Emily. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us on, on this webcast to learn a little bit more about sustainable business practices. Before we get into the details of our presentation, I wanted to give a brief high-level overview of what the concept of sustainability or corporate social responsibility is all about for those of you who are just starting to look into this. Essentially, CSR is a concept where organizations consider the interest of society by taking responsibility for the impact of their activities on customers, employees, shareholders, communities, the environment, and all, all aspects of their operations. Typically referred to as a triple bottom line, where companies consider the impacts of basically three broad categories, social, environmental, and financial. Sustainability is all about creating more value for a company's stakeholders, while minimizing the negative impacts that has on the environment and this community that operates in. The past several decades have drawn our attention to the effects we have on our environment, both as individuals and businesses, and how it affects us. We're not put in a position where we need to do our, do our part to mitigate that impact. As we look towards the next generation, business leaders are seeing that this is the right thing to do. So it's no wonder that CSR reporting is becoming common practice as companies want to tell their story of how they're doing their part. In the upcoming slides, Nick and I will be talking about the main reasons why we, 
why this concept is becoming more and more important to companies, specifically in the food and beverage space, and why this should be on the forefront of your mind as you plan for your business's future. First, we want to take uh, some time to do our first polling question. Emily? All right. Our first polling question is, does your company have a sustainability or CSR plan currently in place? Your options are yes, no, or I don't know. And I'll give everyone a few moments to respond. To participate in the poll, please click the button next to the answer you choose and hit submit. And let's take a look at the results. Justin, back to you. Okay, great. So it looks like maybe about a quarter, a quarter of the participants uh, have gotten into have a CSR plan in place, about half don't. So, so this is good. I think hopefully we can uh, you know talk about a little bit that's relevant to everyone here. So, jumping into why this is important specifically for food and beverage companies, uh, there's there are several factors, and we'll be we'll be drilling down on each of these factors listed on this slide. Um, starting with what may be the most important factor, which is consumer purchasing decisions. So consumer spending habits are changing. And while in the past consumers you know, might have been focusing their purchases just based on the taste and price, uh, now they're focusing on other factors. They're looking at uh, what environmental impact uh, the businesses are having. Uh, you know, sustainable packaging is becoming more important in purchasing decisions. Uh, local sourcing of ingredients is becoming more important. And large retailers are greening their supply chain, which is having an impact at every level, from farmers to wholesalers to the packaging companies that are supplying that packaging. So I found a recent consumer uh, report survey here, which asked customers what they are looking for when it comes to food labeling. So as you can see, based on this little summary here, the most important factor mentioned was locally grown, in which 66% of customers listed as important, and natural, which came in second at 59%. The consumer survey indicated they wanted to support local farmers and were many times willing to pay more for a product to ensure it was produced in a fair working environment. Now, when it comes to the term natural, the survey also showed that more than 75% of consumers consider the meaning of the word natural to mean that it contains no artificial ingredients, artificial colors, or genetically modified organisms or GMOs. But none of that is necessarily true. There's very limited regulation over the use of the word natural on packaging, which can mean mis mislead customers as companies can basically come to their own interp interpretation of what natural means. Um, as you can see here, other important terms listed were organic, pesticide-free, non-GMO, antibiotic-free, certified humane, and fair trade. So now we want to do our next polling question. All right. The second polling question is, what designations are you using on your product? All natural or natural, fair trade, no artificial growth hormones, non-GMO, locally grown or sourced, organic, or none of the above. As a reminder, if you would like to receive CPE credit for today's webcast, you will need to respond to at least three of the four polling questions. And let's take a look at everyone's results. Okay, so it's pretty pretty evenly dispersed here, a uh, concentration on locally sourced and organic. So that's uh, pretty well in line with what those uh, consumers are looking to see. So that's great. So moving on to the next uh, next bullet point of uh, you know why this is relevant to food and beverage. So you know outside of just the customers and, and consumer issues of uh, what they want to see, we're, we're seeing an increase in what employees and recruits want to see, and they're placing importance on corporate sustainability or, or CSR uh, efforts as well. So you know recent surveys that I was able to find uh, indicated that you know 83% of people will trust a company more socially responsible. 90% of young professionals would prefer to work in an environmentally friendly employer, and 50% of young professionals would turn away from an employer that lacked good CSR policies. Now, you know, it's, it's hard to say if that's fully accurate in terms of, you know, if it was a good paying job, if that would place that, more, that much more importance on it. But I guess the way I interpret this is, you know, if all things are considered equal, uh, and, and, you know, a new 
a new recruit coming out of college would be more inclined to pick the company that, that has good CSR policies in place or that they feel like uh, it's having a positive impact on the social environment as well. So with that, I'd like to pass, uh, pass this over to Nick, uh, who's our, our tax specialist here, to talk a little bit about cost savings and tax credits that are available in the, in the sustainability world. Thank you, Justin. Uh, good morning, everyone. We're going to start off by uh, talking about a few tax incentives and credits, um, mostly aligned with companies within the food and beverage space. Um, one that I'd like to start off with that not all companies maybe know about is the fact that you can take a business tax deduction for the fair market value of donated food. Um, like, like other charitable giving, it has to be to a 501c3 organization. And the, um, there are some taxable income limitations on how much charitable donations you could take in a given tax year. And the nice thing about this particular deduction is those limitations are increased from 10% of taxable income to 15% of taxable income. And if you don't end up using uh, the entire charitable donation in, in a given year, Another nice thing about this particular tax incentive is it will carry forward for, for five uh, subsequent tax years. So um, it's, it is something that some companies are taking advantage of. Another nice thing about it is the fair market value, which determines what the tax deduction is, is defined by the retail price uh, at the date of donation. And as we all know, the retail price often exceeds the cost associated with the producing the food that was donated. There is a separate form that you need to uh, file with the IRS if you're going to do this. Um, it's Form 8283. And so this is just a good way to give back to our, our community and, and potentially use food that you weren't going to use anyway or, or just to, to give just because you want to. There is uh, another uh, tax credit available for lots of food and beverage companies that uh, on the surface, I think most companies uh, think that you have, they have to be maybe a technology company or a startup company to, to take advantage of research and development tax credits. However, uh, that's not the case, and in a couple slides we'll go over some examples of, of different food and beverage companies that have taken this credit. But in totality, uh, the credit can be up to 6.5% of the qualified research expenditures. And uh, qualified research expenditures include engineering costs, employee wages, um, the cost of the materials and supplies consumed in the process, if there's any costs associated with obtaining a patent on, on the, the product, or if you're hiring a third party uh, as a contract research development person, the, a portion of their wages can also be used in the calculation. So the one other thing that I'd like to point out about these research and development tax credits before we get into more on the specifics on the credit is that if you do feel like your company is in a position to take these credits in a year that have already been filed, you can retroactively go back and take the credits in those tax years if the statute of limitations is not closed in those years. And the statute of limitations is three years for federal income tax purposes. So how do we know if your company is qualified to take a research and development tax credit? Well, the main thing that we have to do is meet a four-part test. And the four-part test starts out with the product has to have a permitted purpose. And the permitted purpose definition is that the, uh, the product that's developed is basically new or innovative or improved than the product was um, before that. The next part of the test is that the product needs to be technical, technological in nature. So that means that 
through the research and experiment process, the, the company relied on sciences, whether it's engineering, biology, computer science, physics, mathematics, there's some sort of science involved in the process. There also has to be technical uncertainty. So um, the, the product that is being developed obviously has some in uncertainty behind it, and the point of the research and development expenses is to eliminate that uncertainty. So that's the third prong. And the fourth and final prong is a process of experimentation. Uh, the, the taxpayer must use an approach working through um, several iterations of the, of the product to, to kind of make sure that they're um, going about it, tracking the, the different iterations. Maybe it's version 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and maybe version 6 is the, is the one that actually gets put out into the market. So that's the, that's the last test that needs to be documented and proved. So as I mentioned earlier, we're going to go over some examples in the food and beverage space of companies or products that have qualified for this research and development tax credit. The first, which I know is a big fad right now uh, among lots of, of consumers and companies is the gluten-free. So companies that have been able to produce products that closely mimic the normal product that would otherwise have gluten in it have been able to successfully prove to the IRS that that's qualified research and development expenses. Uh, innovative packaging, which you wouldn't on the surface think you wouldn't think would qualify for a research and development, but um, if you think about what Campbell has been able to do with their soup on the go, they essentially have made it possible for consumers to eat soup without a bowl and a spoon. And so what they've done is taken the normal consumption process and changed it to be more user-friendly and easier to just, uh, you know, eat in our busy, in busy schedules. So that the IRS has had concluded qualified for research and development as well. Um, innovative taste, so Coca-Cola which obviously not just Coke because that has its own defined recipe, but Coca-Cola has other products that um, are well known for customizing to local tastes and, and defined markets. So Coca-Cola has been able to figure out with research what particular markets um, want to want to drink and the taste that they like, and the IRS has approved that as qualified development expense. And uh, the last example we have here are craft brewers. Uh, obviously, they're always in the development of new products and new recipes, and also the uh, perfection of existing products. And those, uh, those uh, pro uh, processes and those different products have also qualified for research and development expenses. So just some examples of, of how the food and beverage space has taken advantage of this tax incentive. And just again to reiterate, this is not just a, not just a tax credit for technology companies or, or startup companies. It, it applies to food and beverage companies as well. So uh, next, I'd like to move to a couple different tax incentives that, although on the surface don't relate to sustainability per se, they are prevalent in most companies that process or manufacture their own, own food or beverage products. So the domestic production activity deduction is essentially a tax incentive that could reduce the taxable income of a company by uh, up to 9% as long as, that, um, as long as that company produces or manufactures their products in the United States. The, the one thing about this particular tax incentive is it's only available to companies that are already in a taxable income position. So if your company is in a taxable loss position, it wouldn't be available to you. However, the one thing to point out before we move on to the next uh, item is that this particular deduction is for manufacturing or food processing companies. But if you have 
if your company is a mainly distribution or wholesaling of food or beverage products, and you have a line of business or an arm that does manufacture or, or uh, make the product, that particular line of business, even though it's a small portion of your business, could still qualify for this particular tax deduction. The next uh, thing I'd like to talk about briefly is an IC disc company. Uh, an IC disc company is basically a paper company. And it's, um, although a lot of times when, when I talk to, uh, to companies about this, they, they say, well, if it's a paper company only and it doesn't impact my operations or reporting or anything else, it's, it can't be respected by the IRS. But it actually is respected by the IRS. There's a, there's a separate form that's filed annually with the IRS, so, so they are on board with this. And what it does is that it will treat certain income from qualified sales that are sold outside of the U.S. at a 23.8% tax rate currently, other than taxing that income at ordinary tax rate, which could be approximately 34 to 40%, depending on whether your company is a C corporation or a flow-through entity. The main gist behind these two incentives are the IRS really wanted to incentivize companies to have their products made, processed, manufactured in the United States rather than having them outsource the, the work outside of the United States. So there are just two nice incentives that a lot of food and beverage companies take advantage of. So um, may not relate to sustainability so much, but wanted to point those out because we did think they were important. So we're going to move to um, some, some uh, environmentally friendly tax credits. Uh, the, the first two bullet points there relate to individual tax credits. So and, um, the energy property credit, if you're building a house or, or what have you, and you've got environmentally friendly windows, fans, or heat pumps, you could be eligible for a tax credit. Um, likewise, the, the next bullet there, there's some energy efficient property credits for solar panels, wind energy, uh, geothermal heat pump, stuff like that. So just keep in mind, if those are, like I said, those first two are for individuals. Um, these last three points are for businesses. And so, there is a, an energy investment tax credit for businesses, and what this is is 30% of the qualified expenses for things like windmills, solar energy, geothermal equipment, and things of that nature could uh, qualify for a tax credit. Also, a, a couple others are some nuclear energy credits. If the company has equipment that produces electricity, through means other than basic oil, gas, what we, what we traditionally would think of, then there's likely a uh, related tax credit associated with that. And, uh, the final bullet point there, if, if your company produces use, or uses, um, for instance, fuel, but that through the process could be, that fuel could be reused in another setting, um, whether it's biodiesel or re renewable fuel, you could receive up to a, a dollar per gallon tax credit for that, and uh, that generally requires a certificate uh, to qualify for that tax credit. So certainly there's other tax credits as well um, that, that are available, but these are the ones we wanted to focus on for this particular topic as they relate to environmentally friendly sustainability. So it looks like we're on to our third polling question. So Emily, you want to take right. it? Our third question is, are you currently claiming any tax incentives or credits for your sustainability efforts? Yes, no, but we should be. No, we don't qualify for anything, or I don't know. And for those of you that would like a copy of today's slide deck, you can download them from the folder that says slide deck and handouts at the bottom of your screen. We will also send the slides via email after the webcast. And let's take a look at the results.
Okay, so we're, we're pretty split um, with the majority of I don't know and, and um, you don't think that they qualify. So um, that, that doesn't surprise me. You know, I think the, the most important thing and the takeaway from this is to make sure you're, you're talking with your service provider and, and just making sure your own company personnel or, you know, the business owners themselves are knowledgeable about the different sort of tax credits and incentives that are out there with respect to this industry. So uh, we're going to move on from, uh, from uh, tax incentives and move into kind of some cost savings. What I'd like to do is just take us through an example of, um, you know, how food waste affects manufacturing companies. So here's an example of a bakery. A bakery produces about 175 tons of food waste per month. So it seems like an awful lot. Um, the average cost of the ingredients for a ton of bread is $370. And uh, the average loss sales on, on that, that is uh, about $1,400. So if, if you think about what's happening in our, in our typical bakery, their uh, raw materials that they're wasting, uh, the ingredients themselves just from waste is $64,000 a month. And the lost sales associated with, with that is about a quarter of a million dollars a month. So some, some pretty substantial um, savings to be had with uh, with ability to, to kind of reduce that waste. And, you know, I know talking from some friends, colleagues, clients, that there's there are waste tracking solutions available for about $500 a month. So, you know, is that worth it to your company? Um, obviously, for, for a bakery, uh, if the waste tracking solution could impact the, the amount of waste at all, you could see how it would quickly pay for itself. So obviously, every company is in a bakery, and, and there's going to be different types of waste associated with different processes and procedures and different types of food and beverage companies. So there's a, a, a few different wastes that I'd like to discuss that are common for most companies. Uh, the first is waste by design, and that's basically, you know, the product is developed and designed to in, include some sort of loss. and so. An example of this would be juicing or canning or processing fruits where you're going to have, you know, skin, seeds, other things left over. So the, the takeaway there is, you know, not, not every single company would have this particular example, but is there anything within your process that creates byproduct and is there anything that you can do to either eliminate or reduce that byproduct uh, in an effort to, to reuse it and, and help your profitability? Uh, the second type of waste is yield losses. Um, this is where a company's routine situations present, uh, prevent them from using all of the raw materials purchased um, in the production process. And so an example of this would be damaged goods or spilling occurring during transportation, um, spoilage due to forecasting errors, or just inefficient procedures or poor equipment altogether. So, you know, it's important to understand what's happening during the production process to create the final product and also what happens from the time it leaves your companies to the ultimate end consumer. Is there, is there things happening in that process that it's also uh, creating waste? The final waste we'd like to talk about is quality losses. And this is basically the failure to meet and safety quality standards. So if, if goods are not suitable for sale due to packaging or, or product recall, um, you've basically invested in raw materials, packaging and labor that you're never going to be able to monetize. Uh, in addition to that, this particular um, waste can cause other losses outside like bad press and other sorts of things. So speaking of bad press, we want to just kind of talk real quickly about some things that um, are near and dear to I'm sure all of your hearts. The, the 
Park Doctrine essentially solidified the FDA's authority to criminally charge the corporate executives and high-level managers. Um, I think one of the, the takeaways here is that unlike manufacturing or producing widgets, food and beverage companies, their product almost exclusively is being consumed by the end user. And because of that fact, uh, those companies are held to higher standards. So, you know, an example here is uh, the Peanut Corporation of America had a, a salmonella outbreak. And, you know, this is an extreme example, obviously, but the owner was sentenced to 28 years in prison for knowingly selling peanut products uh, that were contaminated with salmonella. So I don't think many people on this call would ever do that. I mean, that's obviously, you know, profitability over well-being and, and health. Um, but, you know, you can see that the penalties are, are pretty strict for, for noncompliance. And uh, another, another uh, example here is quality A. Obviously not to the same degree as the peanut corporation, but there was a, another salmonella outbreak. Quality Egg distributed uh, products that were linked to, to salmonella and, and sickened about 1,000 people. The, the difference here is the company executives didn't know that their products were sickening customers, but nonetheless they were cited by the FDA for failing to have control over their processes and failing to um, control salmonella growing in their product. So um, again, the, the takeaway here is just to make sure you understand what's going on in your process and also for food and beverage companies to understand what's going on in the process of anyone in your life cycle. Uh, or because what happens is if, if a product is developed and you are uh, one person in, in the cycle, someone else's error could, could mean your error as well. So just be cognizant of that and know who the, the people that you're working with are as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Justin to speak about some more regulatory compliance issues. All right, thanks, Nick. Um, so, you know, jumping into regulatory compliance, I think, uh, you know, there are, there are other regulatory compliance issues relevant to sustainability or social responsibility that have come out in recent years that focus on um, conflict minerals, uh, eliminating the use of slave labor in a, in a company's supply chain. Um, but, you know, really relevant to food and beverage companies uh, is the recent issue uh, relating to food labeling. So what you have in this area is two, two acts that have come out recently. Um, you have the Safe and Accurate Food Labeling Act of 2015, which would essentially require the Food and Drug Administrator, sorry, I didn't jump into the slide here, but uh, it, it would require the uh, Food and Drug Administration to, to regulate the distribution and labeling related to bioengineered foods. Um, you know, often referred to as genetically modified foods or, or GMOs. So this, this act was passed by the House in 2015. Uh, it's now with the Senate consideration, and it's, it's, uh, it's as far as I, as I can see, still with the Senate. So there's a lot of speculation um, out there that's saying, you know, this isn't ultimately going to pass, um, but, but it is out there, so we wanted, wanted you to be aware of that. Um, next, you have S-764 which was actually signed into law by uh, President Obama in July 2016, and uh, has largely been seen as a bill to, designed to nullify many of the labeling laws um, put into place recently by states such, such as Vermont, Connecticut, and Maine. Um, the verdict's still out on the overall impact. Um, its intent was to create a national standard for labeling foods, but the general consensus uh, seems to be that it wasn't effective with one of the many complaints being uh, that, that, that the bill actually allows for QR codes in place of um, actually specifically putting on your label, uh, what, you know, whether there is any genetically modified ingredients. Um, and, and obviously the QR, the QR codes require, you know, reliable internet in the grocery store, uh, a smartphone, and they also assume that a consumer would take the time to actually scan that code and, and learn about the product before they buy it. And, you know, realistically, consumers aren't doing that. They want to be able to look at the product uh, label and, and see right there whether it has something that they're interested in, in buying or not. So there, there are a lot of criticisms um, around this 
around this act that was passed, and, and it's, it's likely going to be uh, challenged in federal court as the, seems to be the general consensus and, and maybe ultimately reversed. But, you know, there is a lot of buzz in the industry about uh, non-GMO and product labeling and, you know, the extra cost that it would cost companies depending on, uh, you know, the, the details of these bills that are being passed. So, obviously, it's something to continue to monitor um, as, it, as it may impact your company going forward. And so the final, final factor uh, we wanted to touch on a little bit, you know, and why this is relevant to food and beverage companies um, is, is the actual reporting of the sustainability efforts, right? So you, you have two elements. You have what, what's the company doing? Uh, you know, what, what are they doing in the social area and the environmental area um, and, and in the economic area? And then you have the actual uh, reporting of it. And, and, you know, the fact is that most companies – whether they're broadcasting or not, are already doing a lot of things that would fall in the category of corporate social responsibility or sustainability. And the reporting itself is just a way to share that story. So when it comes to SR reporting, there are a lot of variations. So, I mean, in the U.S., integrated reporting is not really common practice um, yet. You know, I think, you know, maybe down the road it becomes something that, that companies are doing. But right now it's, it's a lot bigger in, in other companies in, or in other countries in Europe, um, other parts of the world where, um, you know, you have a big company that has an all-inclusive report that includes both what would be included normally in a 10K, but also um, all of their impacts and their key performance in, indicators that they're monitoring um, and, and following. So, again, not, not huge in the U.S., you, you then have uh, a CSR report, right, which is an exclusive document put out separately from the financial statements that, that focuses primarily on that. You know, what, what are the social impacts you're having? What, what are you doing in your community um, to, to better that community and, and uh, impact the, the stakeholders of your company? You have a code of conduct or other supply chain reports. Obviously, you have, uh, you know, large uh, big box retailers um, asking that their, their vendors uh, fill out these code of conducts supply chain reports to sort of validate the, the claims that they're making. You have uh, website claims and assertions, pretty much anything you put on your website it relating to, you know, green, green technology, green labeling, your product, that's all, that all falls within the realm of uh, CSR reporting. Product certifications, you know, you have, uh, like what we talked about earlier, organic, non-GMO, um, these, these are all in that category as well. And then just general other marketing materials that are put out there. Um, for the public to see. So, you know, CSR reporting is very in inclusive. There are a lot of different areas um, that it covers, um, so it's not just exclusive to a, a single individual report. So I think, you know, if you look at the general, the, the, the concept out there and what people think about when they think of CSR reporting, I think a lot of people think, oh, this is, relate this is exclusive to the big companies, big publicly traded companies. But, uh, what we've seen in some recent studies is really that that's not the case at all. There are um, a lot of mid-sized companies that are embracing this concept and using it as a, as a means to attract new customers and also to attract employees. As I mentioned, uh, you know, this is becoming more and more important to uh, the, the people that are coming out of school now, the millennial generation. Obviously, there's been a lot of talk about that um, and, you know, and, and the way that the things that inspire them and, and drive them in their careers are, are different than maybe it has been in the past. And, you know, I think there's there's maybe some truth to that, but um, I think the mid-sized companies are really embracing this. So they, in this survey, survey there were 173 mid-sized companies that were um, that were surveyed, and about two-thirds of them, um, which employed between 100 and 5,000 employees, reported they're seeking to enhance or establish their CSR programs. Um, what what the main focus uh, of those mid-sized companies that were doing this, it seemed to be more on the social side. So, you know, they focused on what are they doing on the education, uh, demonstrating the company's dedication to people-focused initiatives um, versus, you know, their environmental impact, which a lot of times I think the environmental side of things is seen as, as more of a marketing tactic, whereas the, the social and people-focused initi initiatives are, are really what, what um, you know, makes people want to come work for the company. Um, the survey also showed that disclosure of carbon footprint calculations is becoming increasingly common. 
um, and is required in some countries. So, for example, in the, in the UK, um, if you are a publicly traded entity on the UK stock exchange, you, you have to disclose your carbon footprint. So that's becoming, uh, you know, obviously lar a large factor worldwide. Uh, we aren't quite there yet in the U.S., um, but companies, you know, both internationally and domestically are starting to uh, disclose their carbon footprint. You know, the main things or the main reasons that they're looking to do this are to demonstrate that they're, they're, um, they have an awareness of the emissions that their company is putting out, right? Business leadership, uh, they want to show that business leadership is understanding the associated risks, how they're creating opportunities to innovate and generate revenue um, from sustainable products and services. And also, they want to demonstrate how they're future-proofing their business from uh, climate change and water impacts. You know, another thing to note is, obviously, you don't, you don't start managing something until you start measuring it. So, you know, it's easy to think about something in broad terms, but once you actually go about, you know, developing a way to, to measure that, then it's easy to create a baseline and, at that point, start, um, start minimizing your impact and decreasing your impact, which ultimately results in, um, you know, cost savings as well. So another, another recent survey uh, that was out there with the, with the AIC today, um, and they, they asked questions of members in the private, public accounting, and, and government sectors. And this survey explored the existence of sustainability function services um, at organizations 10 years ago versus today, and what, what are the trends that are coming out of that now? And whether organizations are expected to increase their focus on sustainability over the next five to 10 years, um, and then what were the drivers that were expected to drive this change? So the majority of the respondents were mid to senior level executives. Um, of the business and industry respondents, the majority were in finance and accounting, which makes sense, right, because it's an AICPA survey. But, uh, of the business and industry respondents, 45% were from public companies and 55% were from private companies. So it was a pretty even mix uh, between the two. So members in the business and government sectors, um, you know, were asked whether they anticipated the organization's focus on sustainability would increase over the next five years. Um, and they were also asked whether they anticipated that the organization's focus on sustainability would um, would increase over the next 10 years. So most folks uh, are about 54% believe that there will be an increased focus on sustainability over the next five years, and even more um, believe that there will be an increased focus in the next 10 years, which is about 59%. So we wanted to use this opportunity to ask, uh, ask you all, um, you know, what your thoughts are on this. So uh, do, do you anticipate that... Oh, yeah, go ahead. This is our question. Sorry. <laughs> go ahead, Emily. <laughs> The final question is, do you anticipate that your organization will increase its focus on sustainability over the next five to ten years? Uh, yes, no, or I don't know. And once you have completed all CPE requirements, you will be able to download a PDF of your CPE certificate from the certification icon at the bottom of your screen. And let's see what everyone says. Okay, so pr pretty pretty overwhelming majority there. Um, Eighty-two percent uh, think that the organization will increase their its focus, and I, I mean I I would agree with that. I think you know the trends we're seeing it's obviously trending heavily that that direction. So companies that aren't thinking about this are definitely probably uh, maybe starting to you know fall behind the trend a little bit, uh, or maybe should start investigating just to see what they can can start um, start focusing on this as it becomes increasingly important. Um, getting back to the survey results, you know, the survey respondents anticipated that uh, the main drivers that would drive organizations increased focus and in spending on sustainability is, uh, you know, to meet legislative or regulatory requirements. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the, the packaging, labeling, and obviously there's some costs associated there. Um, to enhance to manage the organization's reputation, to manage costs, and to meet customer expectations. So. You know, this doesn't focus so much on the employment side of things, but, um, you know, it all kind of boils back to the factors that we've talked about over, this, uh, over the course of this presentation, which is, you know, the sustainability um, programs have, have a big impact on really all areas of your business. 
So, um, you know, the last area we want to talk about is is really just for a company who who hasn't done any CSR reporting in the past, and and may may have a program in place, or maybe maybe it's a you know informal program. We just they just know they're doing something, um, you know, some things that to reduce the impact, but but it's not necessarily tracked. Uh, we wanted to touch just on you know basically four steps you can take as you start to um, start to look at, at uh, developing a program and or reporting on that program. So, you know, the first step is deciding on a framework. So, I, I was part of the Moss Adams Corporate Social Responsibility Working Group, um, which actually was formed back in 2010. And, and through that process, I know that, you know, we went through some challenges, even just starting something from scratch. And, and you know, what, where do you go about even coming up with what you should be reporting on, right? And fortunately, there, there are a lot of resources out there. Um, you know, there, there's no mandatory reporting in this area still. It's, a, it's an area where, you know, it's kind of the wild west right now. You can, you can do just about anything. Um, you can report on just about anything you want to. But, you know, you want your information to be relevant to, to the users, right? And so a couple examples of some frameworks out there is the, the Global Reporting Initiative, or GRI, um, and the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, or SASB. So, you know, neither one of these are, I, I would say, preferred. Um, but, but, you know, they, they provide a basis for establishing a, a reporting format. And, and we actually did, uh, when Moss Adams was doing ours, uh, we looked at the Global Reporting Initiative, or GRI, uh, standards to kind of develop our report. Then we ended up heavily customizing it. So we didn't report, um, you know, fully in line with the GRI standards, but it was helpful in, in helping us to get that, get that started. So after you've decided on your framework, the next, next step is to define your goals and measurement systems. So, uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier, you don't, you don't start measuring, uh, you, you don't start managing something until you start to measure it. So, you know, figuring out what, what, are, your, what are your goals with the organization, um, you know, clearly developing a baseline and then setting benchmarks and, and long-term goals. So it's good to have a combination of both short-term goals, you know, what can we impact in the next year, and then also, uh, you know, long-term, up to five, ten years, you know, what do you want to do, or is your ultimate goal to go paperless or, you know, something along those lines, and, and setting those, those stretch goals um, a lot, as well as maybe some, some low-hanging fruit or easy, easy to meet goals uh, to get some moments in line. Next step is demonstrating a connection. You know, it's, it's, it's very important, uh, you know, obviously as a, as a business owner, as a business leader, um, you know, you, you don't want your CSR plan to detract from your, from your uh, or distract from your financial goals, right? And so, you know, hopefully you can, you can align the two and, and come up with a growth plan uh, that also uh, factors in, you know, the cost savings associated with sustainability programs and, um, and hopefully they, they align well and that, um, and that, and that you're following those and tracking those. You know, the key is consistency. The, the reporting for CSR and, uh, and financial reporting shouldn't be individually exclusive. I mean, you know, it, these companies that are putting out uh, integrated reports, that's the whole idea, is that uh, they're, they're uniformly working towards, you know, a handful of different goals with the, with the end result uh, being the same. And finally, uh, you want to be consistent. Uh, consistency between between these reports, um, you know, such as SEC filings or press releases or anything you put out there, you want it to be consistent because if you're putting out, you know, a CSR report that says has totally different data than than you put out in a press release, you know, obviously you lose some credibility there. Um, I should also note that it's always a good idea to continue to show your progress even if you fall short. So if you are putting out a, a formal CSR report, you know, the, the tendency I think is to kind of brush things under the rug when you feel like you didn't meet your goals. Or um, you know, if you if maybe revise your goals if you don't hit them. But I think you know, from a from a user standpoint on the reports and and people who are really reading these reports, they, they want to see that you fell short because it, it, it makes it more real. And they and, you know they want to see okay yes we we fell short on this but here's what we're doing to improve. And the real leaders in this uh, in this area are doing that. I think you know they're 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 take, they're being held accountable and they're. And they're saying why we didn't meet this goal, but uh, but we're, we continue to work towards it. So, you know, just a few things to keep in mind. Um, uh, you know, if you're if you're going about this from the first from the from scratch, and uh, it can be a little bit overwhelming. I know it was um, for us. And you know, even create, creating that baseline data when we put our first report out, um, you know, back in 2011. We're about to release our um, our report coming up here in the next 
in the next month or so for this last year. So um, we look forward to that, and that will be available on our website when we when we put it out. So that concludes the uh, the presentation portion um, of of this. You know, we wanted to leave some time for for questions uh, for those of you out there. So um, if you have questions, feel free to type them in now. Yeah, great. Thanks, Justin. Um, like Justin mentioned, if you have a question, if you could type that into the Q&A box and hit submit. And it looks like our first question is, we are looking into new sustainable packaging for our nutrition bars because our consumers are asking for it. Assuming we move forward with this, can we capitalize on this investment by claiming a credit? Yeah, well, there's, uh, this is Nick, thanks for the question. There's, there's a number of different requirements, um, but as I read in, in the, some examples we, we gave, there, there, is, um, there is packaging and other sorts of things that definitely qualify for that. So the most important thing is to go through that, that four-part test, work with your service provider, or if you don't have a service provider, um, certainly, you can you can email myself or, or ask uh, email Justin, and we can we can help you determine whether or not that's something you can claim or not. Thanks, Nick. Our next question is: What does CSR stand for? I can take that one. That's uh, corporate social responsibility. So it's used it's used pretty uh, pretty interchangeably with sustainability or. Um, Sustainability programs. There, there, there are a variety of terms um, thrown out there that that all kind of mean the same thing. Thanks. Uh, do any of these activities, claiming R&D credits, issuing a sustainability report, et cetera, put us at a greater risk of being audited by the IRS? I can take that one. Um, there's there's no greater risk of being audited by the IRS. Um, they, the IRS has specific initiatives in, in a given year that they look at during the examination process. And although um, a couple of years back the, the R&D credit was one of the IRS's initiatives, the, the fact that you claim the credit in and of itself on a tax return would not, would not uh, get you any more likely to be pulled for examination. And if you do get pulled for examination, um, I know Moss Adams has a, has a research and development tax group that uh, does a very good job and, um, you know, and most of the time, especially when we're the ones involved in setting up the credit to begin with, uh, uh, defend the credit to 100% certainty. Thanks, Nick. Our next question, can I ask my industry suppliers what their business practices are in an attempt to green my supply chain? I, I, I think so. I mean, I, it's, it's out there now, and I think, you know, as we mentioned, this is something that, um, you know, companies should be aware of, um, you know, and if, if they aren't aware of that, then, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's your right to know as a customer um, if they're doing anything like this, and I don't see, I don't think that that would be deemed inappropriate by, by any company. Yeah, everyone in the, in the supply chain uh, in the food, food space is kind of in it together because if something happens to the end product, they usually go throughout the whole supply chain and, and try to figure out, you know, who the culprit was if there was one. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, who sponsors the Sustainability Accounting Standard Board? So, you know, this was kind of a self-formed um, a body that that wasn't isn't really uh, I, I wouldn't say it's supported by you know any any other formal frameworks not supported by the you know, AICPA or anything like that. It's it's really just a, a group that that started started this and started putting out uh, standards and and they, they aren't an authoritative body by any means at this point. Okay, thank you. Uh, we are always innovating trying out new products, containers, and ways to improve our product by eliminating artificial sweeteners, et cetera. How do I know what activities qualify for the previously mentioned R&D tax incentive? Well, uh, kind of what I was speaking about before, yeah, you just have to look at each process and each product 
um, on an individual basis and make sure that you're, you're tracking your uh, different iterations of, of what you've done to create the product. Um, you know, go through that four-part test. Make sure you, you can check all of those boxes. And uh, you know, the other thing is there's case law out there that uh, sometimes are on point with your particular uh, product that you're trying to develop. So, um, or at least uh, you know, a similar product. So um, again, you know, I mentioned a lot of companies probably in the food and beverage space, you know, just don't think they qualify. But you know, there are there are good um, historical evidence that you would. Great, thank you. We are a farming operation and have received state mandates for water reduction and reuse. Do these qualify as sustainable business acts, or would they qualify for any credits? Sorry, credits, given that they are mandated. Well, that's kind of a two-part question. Um, so what was the first part again? Um, we are a farming operation and have, have received state mandates for water reduction and reuse. Do these qualify as sustainable business acts, or would they qualify for any credits given they are mandated? I think on the, on the first part, I mean, certainly, if you're doing any kind of CSR reporting, you could take credit for a water reduction as a, you know, whether it's your your goal or just something that's happened through through um, you know your business as it evolves. So certainly, yes, I think that would fall under a sustainability, um, you know, fall within the realm of sustainability, and, and you could report on that. I'll, I'll defer to Nick on the tax side. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's nothing specific that I know of in a tax credit with respect to water reduction. But again, if, um, you know, one of the examples I gave earlier is if, if you, you know, do something that helps eliminate the, the use of what would normally take uh, oil or gas uh, in the process, if, if, if you can do anything with respect to that, then it, might, then it might help you qualify for a credit. Great. Looks like we have time for one more like question. Where on our tax returns do I look to see if our tax provider is adding these types of credits in for us? We file an 1120. Would it be in the credit section of Form 1120, Schedule K? So you file an 1120 or an 1120S? Uh, so they say we file an 1120. Okay. Uh, well, the, the R&D credit is uh, form 6765, so that one you would want to, um, that would want, you'd want to check on that. And I can see that, uh, that Carly said they are an S corporation. Um, so there is a, a spot on Schedule K if you're an S corporation uh, down towards the bottom that would say credits where you would be able to see if those credits were taken. Um, there's also another form that the tax credit would be, would be shown on, which is form, uh, form 3800, I believe, is where it, it kind, of, um, kind of culminates all of the tax credits. So. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you for the great questions today, and thank you, Nick and Justin, for a great presentation. Um, as a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet in order to receive credit. If you participated as an individual and met all certification requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE icon at the bottom of your screen. Open the icon and click the printer in the lower right corner to download a PDF copy of your certificate. I'll keep the webcast console open for a few minutes to give you time to download this now. A copy will also be emailed if you're having any problems downloading it at this moment. And here's a link to an online survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete the survey as your feedback is very important to us. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope you'll join us again next time.